And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. That's right, Greta. It is Friday, and this is our own personal Friday climate protest. Climate Change Roundtable, episode 93. Today's title, Climate Change Killjoys. First, they came for your appliances. I'm your host, Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute. Joining us, we have our regular panelists, Dr. H. Sterling Grinnett, Director of the Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate, and Linnea Lucan, our Research Fellow at the Robinson Center. Welcome, guys. Good to see you again. I'm hoping you have a, uh, a great start to the new year. Thank you very much. I was just in Arizona for a couple of days giving a presentation at the uh, Arizona Free Enterprise Club uh, legislative kickoff. The video is on my Twitter, by the way, guys, if you guys want to go find that. Um, it was very interesting, but my flights kept getting canceled because they kept putting me on Boeing Max 9s, <laughs> which is the oh. plane that that door blew off of. <laughs> And so oh, no. uh, they all got grounded. So I got in late and I am scrambling to play catch up now. <laughs> I, I told her, I told her to tough it out, to demand that they put her <laughs> on the damn flight and uh, strap her in. She could, she should treat it like a, you know, a, a really, really high bungee jump or, or, or a really extreme roller coaster. But she, she, she didn't like that idea. Cool. Well, uh, you know, entropy is everywhere. Speaking of entropy and crazy things, let's kick off the show as we usually do with our crazy climate news of the week. First of all, this is an email that came to me uh, from a journal, uh, which is uh, Nature Climate Change, which is specifically about climate change. And I, I wanted to bring it up because look at the titles here. Tackling inequality is essential for behavioral change for net zero. The potential of wealth taxation to address the triple climate inequality crisis. Adaptation requires attuning to shifting temporal patterns. Basically, it's all about convincing people that climate change is a catastrophe, it's real, it's present danger, and all that stuff. And it, it, there's no facts in any of this. It's all about social stuff. I mean, what has the world gone to? Well, look, it's, it's, very, it's very disturbing. Um, they want to talk, uh, climate alarmists want to talk about climate, uh, uh justice. They want to talk about, uh, but there is no, the climate it doesn't participate in the justice system. <laughs> you know, what is fair or unfair to the climate? They want to talk about, uh, environmental justice by which they mean, uh, minorities, uh, disadvantaged people. Uh, but the climate, in fact, doesn't discriminate uh, amongst them. They may be disparately impacted, but the poor are always disparately impacted by anything. Uh, but especially if they uh, live in areas that are prone to natural disasters naturally, they're going to be more affected than the rich. The, you know, the Biden administration has said this is all about uh, we, we want to make uh, uh, climate justice a hallmark of our uh, every policy. But, you know, inequality, the, the climate doesn't know from inequality. It, <laughs> it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't say, oh, well, I'm going to adjust, adjust myself to make sure um, harms or benefits are more equally distributed because the climate right. is, is, is socialized and communist. My, uh, Mother Nature is ridiculous. an equal, oppor equal opportunity disruptor. She'll squish anyone like a bug. That's right. So it's like, um, this is all nonsense. In the end, you can do all the social justice work you want. 
you know, if that's if that's if that's what you think is truly important, um, I have I have uh, remarked in the past that uh, communists can't make communism can't make people equally rich, but it can make us all equally poor. You can do that. You can lower all our standards of living, but it won't change the climate, and the climate won't change because we're doing good justice stuff. It's 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 foolish. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it was if what they were talking about here and all they were concerned about was trying to help, you know, poorer neighborhoods become more resilient to bad weather, you know, if they were saying, let's help try to fix some of these poor neighborhoods that are in river deltas <laughs> that flood all the time, that would be one thing. But that's not what they're talking about. <laughs> they're talking about yeah. trying to bring other people down so that they can uh, level the playing field by by making everyone miserable, basically. Well, the other thing that they're talking about is 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 somehow if we can reduce temperatures by zero zero one degrees a hundred years from now, it will help the poor better than if we actually give them economic opportunities today, so that uh, they are wealthier in the face of whatever climate change does a hundred years from now. And that's you know that's just false. Yeah, it does. So here's the question: When the temperature goes up, do the oppressed sweat more? I don't know. Okay, so let's take a look at the next story. <laughs> the end of snow from the New York Times. Oh my goodness. This happened. This was an article, an opinion piece. And I use the word opinion strongly here because there's no science or anything in this. Yeah. This was on January 2nd. And basically, it's this person talking about our experiences right? Every Christmas, my husband and I pack up ourselves and our eight-year-old and leave Brooklyn for a visit to Nebraska. Well, you know, travel experiences with snow is not science, lady. And but the one thing that really struck me is for superstitious people like me who believe that if we think through the worst case scenarios, you know, for climate, the products of our imagination will serve as talismans to ward them off, Ooh, the disappearance of snow is just one unfortunate potential future scenario. You know what well, I love about this? What I love about this? First off, they they ran the same headline more than a decade ago, and snow didn't end then. Uh, actually, and, back in two thousand, March two thousand, we have uh, yeah. a, a some 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 screen caps here of this famous article by Dr. David Viner. Snowfalls are just a thing of the past. And so, this is in March of 2000. Yeah. So um, the New York Times uh, not only is sort of rehashing a, a, a story that proved false before, but they released the story on the eve of a pending huge super winter storm that's not just affecting the Northeast or will not just affect the Northeast or the Northwest, uh, you know, heavy. 100 inch snowfalls. Um, but it's going to freeze down here in Dallas. They're already warning again of power outages due to uh, uh, five straight days of uh, uh, several days of sub zero temperatures, maybe breaking records. So, when are you going to issue a, 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 a story called the end of snow just as the snow starts to fall heavily? It's, it's beautiful. It's the, uh, it's the Al Gore effect where you call for a conference on climate disaster and then you get snowed out. <laughs> that that's happened so often it's been dubbed the gore effect because th th there was a whole hilarious series of years where he would go to these things and it would snow or whatever but okay back in 2000 dr david viner made this statement uh and this is this is what the article says however the warming is so far manifesting itself more in winters which are less cold than in much hotter summers, according to Dr. David Viner, a senior research scientist at the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia, where ClimateGate started. Within a few years, winter snowfall will become a very rare and exciting event, and children aren't going to know what snow is, he said. You know, interestingly enough, that has been bandied about so much by the climate skeptic community that the newspaper removed it from their website. They took it off because it was too embarrassing for those expert climate scientists to deal with that idiotic prediction. But well, it, but it but it wasn't it literally wasn't just that opinion piece. In 20 in 2004, I just uh, shared a a New York Times article. This is the second time they've literally run that headline. New York Times uh 28 2014 
the end of snow. That's that's literally the same headline um, that the New York Times ran. It's uh, it's amazing how yep. wrong the mainstream media can repeatedly be and never learn. You know, it's like watching the BBC report on what's going on in the Middle East. They keep having to issue apologies, but they're not issuing ap apologies for this BS. Yeah. And today during our Heartland chat in the background on our uh, channel, Linnea was talking about how much she missed snow because she moved away from it. <laughs> Everyone was really mad at me about that one, but I yeah, stand right. by my comment. I believe it was recommended that you be forced to move back to Chicago, but uh... <laughs> yeah, let's bring up that map to show the current snowfall around the United States before. There it is. Gosh, the, does that look like the end of snow to you? That's the current snow depth all around the United States. That mm. looks to be about half of the contiguous United States. Uh, United States has snow on it. Yeah. Ugh, idiots. All right, let's go on to our next one. Hertz is selling 20,000 electric vehicles to buy gasoline cars instead. Oh, no. You think maybe things are just really bad for rentals? Nobody wants them because, gosh, you can't drive a distance with them. You have to charge them all the time. You spend more time charging than you do driving in lots of cases. So people are pushing back. The economy is dictating what they're doing. Well, you know, for Hertz, the problem is the Biden administration, by the way, just months ago was lauding them for their investment in electric vehicles. They, they had big press conference. Oh, Hertz is doing great things by buying all these electric vehicles, accounting for a lot of the EV sales that we, everyone talked about. Um, uh, that's going to slack off. So um, first off, most of these vehicles are Teslas. And Tesla's cutting the price of its new cars. When you cut the price of new cars, used car values go down. So they're losing billions of dollars on the books because their uh, inventory is being devalued. In addition, Nobody wants to buy used electric vehicles because of the problems that they have. Uh, Hertz says uh, that their vehicles um, have uh, fewer maintenance issues than gasoline-powered vehicles, but that when they do have a problem, they are two to three times more expensive to fix, and they're out of, uh, out of service for much longer periods of time. So what are they doing? Not only are they shedding more than a third of their electric vehicles, they're replacing them with gasoline-powered and diesel-powered vehicles. The old internal combustion engines are not going away anytime soon if Hertz is still buying them. Yeah, it's all a pipe dream, the whole electric thing. All right, next topic. Get this. It's really bad in California, the greenest state in the nation, because they're in a budget deficit that's huge. And they're finally waking up to the idea that, hey, maybe we can't blow so much money on climate after all, because it doesn't return anything. So Newsom's cutting $2.9 billion from the California climate programs and defers an additional $1.9 billion in the future. Oh, no, what will they do out there? The climate's going to self-destruct in California now. Oh my goodness! The signs are everywhere that climate is uh, the, the climate agenda is losing steam. Well, I mean, California is already so far down the trail on this issue that it's hard to see what just reducing their. Um, well, it's hard to find a, a light here with California, <laughs> even though they're reducing their uh, investment there. It's. I mean, you know better than anyone, Anthony. It's really very bad there. Last year, you know, they were asking people not to charge their cars. They're probably going to do it again this year when we have hot temperatures this summer, as long as El Nino doesn't fall off. It's yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's you know, my, madness. My question is this: so they already have these deficits. That's the problem is they they actually face deficits that he's got to, you know, unlike unlike uh, the federal government, most states have to balance their budgets. So he's got deficits on the books. That he's got to balance. How Something does like cutting forty-eight billion? Yeah. So how does cut, cutting future spending solve that problem? I'm glad he's doing it, and I'm glad he's particularly, you know, uh, targeting their climate programs because I think most of them are idiotic and they're bad for people. Uh, I suspect though he's going to have to cut a lot more, uh, and not just future spending, but actual on the ground spending today. Yep. So anyway, 
the point is, is that there's no returns on this investment. All right, final topic. An EV double-decker bus catches fire in London. Yes, the electric vehicle went kaboom. We have a video of this, and it is, well, interesting to say the least. Look for all the video if you can. All right, now get this, they could not put the fire out. You see the fire engines there? Well, these lithium batteries, as you know, they just keep going. They're like the Energizer, Energizer Bunny of fire starters. They just keep going and going and going until the entire bus was consumed. Here's a picture of the results. Look at that, that's all that's left. <laughs> that's, that's left. Wow. Yeah, you can't really put them out with water. I think one place here that used 36,000 gallons of water to put out a small electric battery fire. Um, but uh, are we sure? That that was an, e you know, I don't want to blame EVs for something that's not EVs. Are we sure it's an EV fire as opposed to uh, an airstrike? Uh, they thought hoodies were on that bus. And... <laughs> yeah, it does. All it looks right. like the thing got nuked. It does. Yeah, I, I mean, does. God, you know, All right. so let's... typhoon missile couldn't have done any worse than that. All right. So let's sing along, guys. The wheels on the bus go boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Heat and flames. Heat and flames. The wheels <laughs> on the bus go boom, boom, boom. All through the town. There you go. <laughs> I don't right. think you're going to win any music awards for that one, Anthony. <laughs> EVs, unsafe at no speed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Enough fun and games with climate craziness. Now we're going to go on to our main topic. First of all, I want to bring up this article from earlier. The Biden administration launched an aggressive campaign targeting home appliances with eco-regulations in 2023. Now, we've talked about this a couple of times here on, on this show. And, you know, we've talked about how bad it is for the average consumer. I mean, who wants to buy a washer or dryer or refrigerator or whatever that doesn't work as well as the one you had three or four or 10 years ago? Well, that's what's going to be happening according to the way the Biden administration wants to go. But guess what? The court threw a monkey wrench into this. And this week, the Biden administration's crackdown on dishwashers was dealt a blow by the appeals court. They basically shot the thing down on dishwashers, at least. But there's still all these other things going on. Uh, you know, they're still trying to basically make your washer and dryer less efficient, make your, well, maybe more efficient, but less effective, you know. Um, and It was right. for dish dishwashers and short cycle washing machines. Right. That's right. And, you know, then, then you've got the issues of, uh, you know, they're going after your gas range. Uh, they're going after your barbecue. I mean, literally no aspect of American life is safe from these climate killjoys. They're just after everything in our lives, trying to make it their way, you know, instead of just simply being efficient or, or, or functional, you know. So we have some with us, uh, a person with us today to talk about it. Ben Lieberman is with the uh, the Competitive Enter Enterprise Institute, and um, he's a, a congress as a congressional staffer. He worked on a number of issues related to fuels and vehicles, including the renewable fuel standard and the CAFE standard. He also worked on energy infrastructure, permitting reform, home energy appliance standards. Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer. So he's got a fascinating background. And he joined us today to talk about this madness of going after home appliances. Thanks for joining us, Ben. What do you have to say about all this? Well, I think at this point, it's easier to list the appliances that aren't the subject of bad pending regulations. Televisions are off the hook for now. So let's be grateful for that. But just about everything else that plugs in or fires up around the house is uh, in the midst of being regulated even more than it already is. It's always bad news for consumers, and it's putting the climate agenda ahead of the best interests of the American people. Wow. So basically, the only thing left is the manual can opener, right? That's the only appliance left that's not being affected by climate mm -hmm. change regulation. <laughs> would, would it be would it be fair to say, Ben, that this this uh, 
this onslaught the Biden administration is doing has, is, is sort of unprecedented that no administration has ever gone after as many appliances at once uh, as quickly as the Biden administration is? Oh, it's clearly an acceleration. Now, this has been going on for decades. And in fact, some of these appliances are on their fourth or fifth or sixth round of successively tighter standards. All the more reason to slow down at this point. But uh, instead, we, we see things moving faster than ever. Ironically, it started in January after the administration vehemently denied that it was targeting gas stoves. That almost seemed to be a turn of switch with the, with, the, uh, with, with, with the administration. From that point on, they started going after just about everything in addition to uh, stoves. And so last year, it was a year of proposed new regulations for washing machines, for dishwashers, for refrigerators, ceiling fans, water heaters. This year, 2024, we'll see these rules getting finalized. So we'll, 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 we'll see a battle over these, uh, these final rules. But again, just about everything around the house, many of which uh, have already been badly overregulated, are going to be regulated that much more. And, you know, on the gas stove thing, it's, it's hilarious when Kamala Harris tweets while she cooks in front of her gas stove about her Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners. She's so oblivious, but they were for a gas stove ban. At least uh, it leaked out that somebody said something about it. Uh, the commission said they're going after gas stoves before they were against it. Cause the Biden administration immediately said, Oh no, 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 no. We're not going after gas stoves. And two weeks later they issued rules going after gas stoves. Um, but it's not just appliances that are on multiple generations. I mean, they recently just at, at the end of the year, issued rules for appliances that I'm not aware they've ever regulated before, like uh, home fans and, and and things like that, that just, you know, little things that you don't think about that, that uh, someone's got a fan cooling them off and now it's going to be regulated by the government for energy, which means it's not going to work as well. Typically, that's how it works. Well, what I don't like about uh, regulating fans and motors is it's regulatory double dipping. These are the components used in furnaces and air conditioners and other appliances that are separately regulated. So it's a way for the agency to go after these appliances in two ways, to go after the appliance overall, but then go after the energy using components in some of these compliance. So the level of overregulation is mind numbing. You know, what's funny about ceiling fans is that ceiling fans actually increase the efficiency of heating and cooling in your home by circulating air so the, you know, the warm air doesn't go up to the top and the cold air doesn't stick at the bottom. So, you know, it's, um, how can they, how can they increase the efficiency of ceiling fans? I mean, what's the point there? That's a good question. A lot of these regulations are reading, reaching the point of being counterproductive, even from an energy efficiency and even from an environmental standpoint. Ceiling fans can provide a level of comfort with energy use levels considerably lower than air conditioning. So with a ceiling fan, you may not have to run your air conditioner as much. And on a, you know, like an 80 degree day as opposed to a 90 degree day, you may achieve the level of comfort you need with just the ceiling fan and you don't need to turn on the air conditioner. So what happens when you raise the cost of ceiling fan by as much as 100 Dollars and the proposed new rule may require an expensive switch to uh, ACE from AC to DC motors. So when you make ceiling fans uh, that much more expensive, so that some people at the margins can't afford them, you may be doing more harm than good. But there's a lot of examples of um, of uh, appliance regulations that not only are bad from an economic standpoint, they might even be bad from an efficiency and environmental standpoint, which is the whole rationale for these things. But birds got to fly, fish got to swim, and regulators got to regulate. I guess that's, that's, that's the only explanation. I, yeah. I, think, I think you're being way too kind, Ben. I don't think it's, they're reaching the point where they are, are less efficient or produce less efficiency. I think that that from the very, very start that they were, I mean, you know, you start back with the toilets. We had toilets that worked and then we had toilets that didn't work because they were government mandated and you had multiple flushes. And then you went to light bulbs and, and Minnesota, <laughs> when they first started doing the light bulb ban, when they first started it, Minnesota said, Oh, we're on board with this. And they took all their incandescent bulbs out of their, uh, out of their uh, signal lights at uh, stop, stop lights. <laughs> And then what happened is the winter came 
and the signal lights no longer melted the snow and ice that formed on them because the heat wasn't coming from their new uh, CFL and LEDs, and they had accidents everywhere. And they said, oh, we got to go back to... to yeah. You know, so this is what happens so when policymakers that are not engineers try to do things. They just don't think anything through. Yeah. So, so I, I this has been bad from the start. Government never, ne well, I've read the Constitution. I don't see anything about energy in it. So the federal government never should be should have been in the business of telling people how much energy they can use, whether absolutely or through their appliances. It's not their business. It's just not. And uh yeah. There's plenty of efficient appliances out there. If they want to rate appliances and, and, and inform people that this is the most efficient, this is how much it, supposedly it will save you, that's one thing. But for them to say, no, efficiency in water use or electricity is the most important thing that you should care about and will because we're making it that way, that's wrong. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is that the founding fathers did not put Maytag in the Constitution. They didn't talk about appliances. But yet here we have the federal government making these mandates, which are not part of what they're supposed to be governing. Right. And, 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 and you know, you have to wonder, some of this stuff seems like it fits uh, extraordinarily well into the... Um, you have to get used to living with less kind of narrative that we have been getting from the World Economic Forum and some of the other um, pro net zero type of organizations. And um, that's pretty much the comment that I wanted to make. But I also want to thank Dean very much for the super chat. Um, we really appreciate you as well. So and Rocks and Oil. Thank you very much, Andy, for popping that up for me. <clears throat> thank you, guys. Could you talk a little bit, Ben, about the ruling this week and what it means? Okay, well, uh, a federal court uh, uh, struck down and remanded back to the agency uh, uh, its uh, latest rule on dishwashers and also mentioned uh, 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 washing machines in there. The background of this gets kind of complicated. The Trump administration, their Department of Energy actually did a good thing on dishwashers. Uh, it responded to a petition from my organization, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, that uh, that noted that dishwashers take a lot longer than they used to to finish a load of dishes, and that's because of uh, these uh, these efficiency regulations. They now take two hours or more to finish a load of dishes, whereas pre-regulations dishwashers used to take a, a, an hour or so. And the law forbids efficiency standards that harm product performance. Unfortunately, it happens, but uh, the law technically forbids that, and we petitioned them on this and a court essentially well first the the trump administration the trump department of energy agreed with us and started the process of setting a separate standard that would be achievable by dishwashers that can do the job in an hour and unfortunately like so many trump regulations they were reversed by the biden administration and so 12 attorney generals took on the biden administration reversal of the of the good um, Trump administration dishwasher regulation, the court agreed with us. Agreed that um, that the, uh, the the agency did a wrong thing by uh, by not allowing dishwashers that can do the job in a reasonable amount of time. The court also brought up, as we'd mentioned, the how much. Um, some of these regulations are counterproductive, that because the dishwashers don't clean as well, people are hand washing their dishes before or after. And that means water and energy use may actually go up rather than down. So it's it's a very, very good decision, a very, very helpful decision. The only thing is that's back to the drawing board for the agency. And this is an agency and especially in a Biden administration agency that isn't real good about admitting mistakes, especially when it comes to anything they're doing that's part of their climate agenda. And on a separate uh, efficiency regulation, also struck down by a court not too long ago, the agency essentially came back with exactly the same regulation and just tried to beef up the analysis. And they were shot down by a court a second time on this. Uh, let's hope it's different last time. Let's hope the, the, the agency learned its lesson and isn't going to resist <laughs> But uh, uh, that 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 all remains to be seen. Nonetheless, an excellent decision with uh, implications for dishwashers and clothes washers. It also, I think, stepping back for a, a moment, I think it shows that 
more and more federal judges, they're just sick and tired of being handed a junky analysis from federal regulatory agencies who are banking on the, uh, the, 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 the courts just deferring to them. I, 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 I think you see more and more examples, at least on appliances, you, you, you do where the court just says, no, we're not buying this. You, you have to explain this regulation better. You have to explain why this actually benefits consumers. And, uh, in, in many cases, the, uh, the agency, uh, can add. I, uh, related to this somewhat is uh, another federal court that struck down a uh, Berkeley, California natural gas ban, which I think is also a very uh, helpful thing. This war on natural gas is also something that's related to the this war on uh, uh, on appliances. So I think uh, some good things are happening in the federal courts. So uh, let's be grateful for that. Let's, it looks like uh, some sanity is starting to return to some of this. Um, <laughs> It's just uh, it, it's mind boggling to me that they believe that there's not going to be pushback on this stuff when they throw these these junk things out there, you know, to these federal judges, not just from the judges, but from the general public. I mean, you know, what will happen if we end up with dishwashers that don't wash and washing machines that don't clean and and a microwaves that don't heat or whatever, or gas ranges that don't, you know, work or can't be installed, we're going to end up like Cuba where people are hoarding appliances from the 1950s and 60s because yeah. those are the things that work. Well, and, I think and, cars in particular in California, I think the cost of a, a um, used gas-powered vehicle is going to be astronomical. Yes, and in the process, be. Anthony, you're right, because they'll keep old, older appliances working longer, just like older, you know, say, mowing lawnmowers you can't buy a gas powered lawnmower so they keep going to the repair man to keep their lawnmower and that just means that because efficiency does erode over time and pollution levels increase over time so you're going to have more polluted air and less efficient appliances on the market than you would have if, if the government had just stayed out i want to get to a couple of details about the case uh, ben you know you mentioned that cei uh, had a big role uh with their petition in the trump regulations uh, I don't believe you were party to the lawsuit, though. That was filed by 11 uh, states attorney general led by Jeff Landry of Louisiana. And they argued that it was overreach, that the rules were arbitrary and capricious, which is a violation of federal law. And uh, they were trying to defend consumers. Consumer groups were also, uh, I think they filed friend of the court brief. And uh, in every instance, the courts found that their arguments were correct. It was arbitrary and capricious. Uh, courts don't use very strong language, but uh, when the Biden administration said the Trump rules were not well researched or well grounded, uh, they hadn't done their job, the court said that argument was frivolous. If anything, it was much more grounded than the alternative that the Biden administration put forward. They said the evidence was that Biden's rules were going to use more water and energy. Um Unfortunately, as you say, it's back to the drawing board as opposed to them saying, nope, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the Trump rules. We're just going to institute those until you write something different. Instead, they've, they've left it in limbo. Uh, I, my concern is, uh, you know, Biden does have a history of just ignoring the courts when it's inconvenient. He takes their opinions as advisory as opposed to sort of the law of the land. Um, my concern is that what will happen is, since they just said, uh, go back and do it over better, uh, they'll say, yeah, we'll get to that. And in the meantime, these rules will just stay on the books forever and ever and ever until, you know, you know, it's a fait accompli because the appliance manufacturers have to comply until new rules are in place. And as a matter of fact, uh, the Biden administration has a proposed dishwasher rule that's even more stringent. So we're battling over the last round of dishwasher standards. At the same time, the 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 Biden administration is already trying to make those uh, those standards worse. Now, one thing that 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 made victory a little bit more possible uh, in the courts on this one is that agency deference has a different meaning when the agency was on both sides. The Trump DOE did the right thing, and then the Biden administration tried to reverse that. So you can't defer to the agency when the agency was on uh, on, on both sides.
sides. We're not always going to have that um, going uh, for us. So in other cases, you, you do have to take on uh, agency deference. And of course, the, the whole issue of Chevron deference, that's that's something that's going to be before the Supreme Court uh, soon, you know, how much um, courts ought to uh, defer to regulatory agencies. But this is a very, very good decision. And I think it has implications for uh, a, a number of appliance rulemakings. That said, um, the the ultimate goal is not to try to win in the courts. The ultimate goal is just to take away this regulatory authority. The whole federal appliance efficiency standards program has from the day it was created in 1975. It's been a solution in search of a problem. Manufacturers are perfectly capable of improving products, including making them more efficient over time. Consumers are perfectly capable of making smart decisions, including incorporating, um, um, uh, economizing on their their energy bills in their in their appliance decisions. Yeah. There was never any reason for these standards. The only thing these standards do, and, and also I, I would add, the eco friendly versions are going to be on the market regardless. Uh, um, Manufacturers have shown they'll make models that go above and beyond the, the current standards for those who want them. The only thing standards do is force that choice on everyone, whether it makes sense for them or, or not. And we know that it, 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 it doesn't. So uh, getting rid of this whole program has no downside and would just be a, 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 a blow in favor of increased consumer choice. To be I fair, have I have a question. Um is this related to what's called the Energy Star program, these regulations? Yeah, well, that's 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 one of the reasons why the regulations aren't needed. There's a voluntary program called the Energy Star program run by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Energy that puts the Energy Star label on appliances that are the most efficient in that category. Now, there's a lot of problems with the Energy Star program, how well it's run, but it shows that consumers have plenty of information they can decide for themselves. So you have this voluntary program that highlights the most efficient models. So why do we need standards that essentially force that choice on uh, on everyone? So the, the Energy Star program, I'm not a great fan of it because it's got a lot of uh, a lot of problems as is anything run by the federal government but at least it's a voluntary program that gives consumers information i think we ought to leave that leave it at that as far as the role of the government back back in 2016 uh congress passed a law the congressional review act uh, many no i'm sorry not 2016 i think 2000 and 19, it's been a while 1998 i think yeah they passed the Congressional Review Act, which said if a regulation was going to have more than uh, it, going to have a major impact on the economy, which I think they defined at the time as $100 million, but maybe $50 million, that Congress could weigh in. They had 90 days to reverse it. And to be fair, uh, this Congress and even on the Senate side, with some help up from a few independent Democrats, uh, well, more independent than others, um, they have passed multiple. CRA rejections of Biden appliance rules, um, multiple. The problem is under the CRA, that's a that's a law, and like any other law, Biden can veto it, and he's vetoed every one of these, even when he's had Democrats on board against them. So there's the difficulty. What we need and what we've promoted in the past is something different, which is a rule that says. For any major rule that EPA, DOE, any regulatory body issues, uh, you can set the financial threshold. I'd set it a lot lower than $100 million on the economy, but uh, um, that's just me. Congress must positively approve the regulation. That way, we have true uh, A, transparency, but B, accountability. Congress says, oh, we never intended them to do this. And they throw up their hands, but they give them the power to do that. Instead, if Cong if it, if the burden is placed on Congress to say, yep, we're not going to have approve this uh, natural gas standard. They have to have an up or down vote. And if they don't vote to pass it, the regulation does not become law every time. Uh, if they pass these kinds of things, we can hold Congress accountable directly. And that's, by the way, under the Constitution, where laws are supposed to be made, not by the executive, but by Congress. Well, um, 
more than a year ago, I would have been a little bit worried about that approach because, you know, I, I worked on the Hill. I know how lazy some of those members of Congress are. Would they just rubber stamp some of these things rather than doing their uh, their homework? But after the gas stove dust up, I think that really woke up a lot of members of Congress as to just how unpopular this kind of meddling is with the American people. So I, I do think um, um, the, an up or down vote on appliance regulations would have a much tougher time uh, in, 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 in Congress. Keep in mind, it, it, there, there are manufacturers who like these regulations and they, 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 uh, they send out their, their, their lobbyists as well. But I do think that uh, uh, having an up or down vote on these regulations would, would be a step forward. Although, as I mentioned, I think the, the, the ultimate goal is just to eliminate this program entirely, eliminate the regulatory threat entirely. So, Ben, a question for you. Do you see in the future, if these regulations stay in place, that there might be a black market developing for uh, hot rotting your dishwasher, for example, by changing the electronics or the pump or whatever? Well, you can you can go on to uh, you can go on the internet and find all sorts of uh, videos about how people they they some of them dump a bucket of water into their washing machine in the middle of a cycle that seems to do the trick. Others actually kind of rejigger their washing machine so that it uses more water. Now the caveat there is that will void your warranty and maybe you don't do it right. You need to be uh, uh, you need to know what you're you're doing a little bit. It's crazy that the consumers have to do this kind of thing. And of course, there's, there's ways to tinker with your shower to get more, more water. It's, it's crazy that we have to do it, but there are things that you can do. And in terms of older appliances making a, a, a comeback, that that's something I think uh, uh, we're, we're going to see more of. The, the difficulty there is sometimes it's harder to get uh, replacement parts for some of those older models. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it used to be that uh, you know if your if your appliance was getting old, it was it was not it was an easy decision to buy a new one. Now you have to think twice because nothing gets consumers more angry when they buy a new appliance and they realize that the one they got rid of was one they actually liked better. Yeah, well, you know, with the advent now of easy to print, you know, parts, three D printers and things like that, it's really easy to fix or create parts to fix older appliances now because you can you can print either in metal or in plastic a brand new part to fix it. And so I see that these things are going to last a lot longer than was originally envisioned because the market's going to step up and say, you know what, there's a market here for replacement parts just not being filled. Well, you know, after the toilet uh, regulations came into effect, uh, entrepreneurial individuals were going into old abandoned um, trailers, junk, junk uh, mobile homes, and removing the old five gallon uh, tanks and, and toilets and uh, selling them so you could replace your brand new shiny uh, non-functioning toilet, non-well functioning toilet with an older supposed clunker that use more water but works the way it was supposed to so black markets do arise oh yeah definitely you can do a lot of that stuff and i would recommend people learn small engines as best as they can especially if you live in california or one of the states that are trying to ban small engine uh devices uh, because that stuff is just so much better right now i have a plug-in leaf blower um but I was using an electric one and I and it wouldn't like hold a charge long enough for me to actually finish blowing off my patio. <laughs> so I'm I'm pretty much on team re-repairing, -re you know, constantly keeping up your older equipment. Um, not to mention, you know, this whole idea of, you know, um, boy, the, t the term uh, is is escaping me. Well, there it goes. Anyway, I uh, <laughs> the t the term has escaped me, but there is a there is a word for the intentional making of of many things that actually are important and that work not work anymore. Planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence. Yes, that's the one. That's what I'm looking for. Um, yep. You know the 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 tech companies like you know Apple and stuff are pretty famous for doing things like that. But I I think that um, our appliances and energy, these energy efficiency laws and uh, regulations are kind of adding to that to a point. 
um, because many of the new technologies, like Sterling said, they they just don't last as long. They they right. break down so fast, especially when you start adding in a ton of computer components to them. Um, it's just more stuff to break, and I, I wouldn't doubt if that wasn't kind of part of it too. Yeah. I've actually gotten a lot of anecdotal evidence across a number of regulated appliances to that effect. They don't last as long as they used to. Plus, with a higher repair cost for an old appliance, it just may not be worth it to uh, to spend you know half as much as it's going to take to buy a new one. And one wonders why the appliance makers who sometimes oppose this stuff and sometimes don't Maybe one of the reasons they don't oppose this more is that the, it might be good for sales for them. I was about to say, yeah. you know, there's two things going on. First off, they don't want to be on the bad side of government. They won't. They don't want government to suddenly look at them more. Oh, you're going to oppose us? Okay, well, maybe it's time to do some uh, IRS audits and and things of your because uh, we know that they do things like that. Uh, but secondly, like the auto manufacturers. Uh, they make more money on the higher end appliances, right? It, it, you know, their the profit margin on all those things are higher. And so, and if they don't specialize in lower end appliances, because, you know, there are some companies that's that, that that's what they make, uh, you know, just like uh, firearms manufacturers. There are some that specialize in, in lower cost guns. Well, you especially see that um, with air conditioners. Um, some of the manufacturers of air conditioners have actually petitioned the Environmental Protection Agency for new regulations that require uh, uh, new models to use these new eco-friendly, climate-friendly refrigerants. Uh, it, 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 it's using the, uh, the the using the the law to skew the market towards more expensive new models and, and to regulate their competitors out of existence mm -hmm. to basically put their competitors the smaller or the, the companies that catered to the lower income individuals to put them out of business. Yeah. No you know, question. The these rules, that, they skew the market towards the more expensive appliances. Right. One of the things about the more expensive appliances these days is almost all of them now are coming out Wi-Fi enabled so that they can talk to the cloud and, you know, run apps and all kinds of things like that. And, you know, the, the one of the most common ones is thermostats. You know, there's the Nest thermostat, which was very popular. But guess what? If you own a Nest thermostat, it turns out that without your consent, um, the uh, energy company that supplies your electricity can go in there and turn the thing down when they don't want you to be using too much electricity. And so it's, uh, I, I see a rebellion coming where people, they may be forced to buy these Wi-Fi enabled things, but they don't put them on the Wi-Fi. They just simply leave them isolated from the internet. So nobody outside the house can go mess with them, which is something that's certainly a threat to, um, to every homeowner in the United States or every renter in the United States that uses electricity. Well, I think the, the Internet of Everything uh, could be a good thing for appliances, being able to set your thermostat when you're not home and that kind of thing, if individual liberty were respected. But it's most definitely not. And in fact, there was a bill last year to require that water heaters be uh, um, uh, um, um, manipulatable by the utility so that when they're producing more wind energy than there's a need for, that they can heat your water then. Uh, uh, so, uh, so there's the, 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 this outside, uh, uh, um, been, uh, turning on and off of appliances. I, I, I think that the American people are going to be very strongly opposed to that, but we need to keep an eye on that because these bills do crop up and they're cast in ways that make it sound like it's a, it, it's good news for consumers when that's anything but the case. Right. Right. So uh, I want to remind everyone who's watching today that you can ask questions, uh, leave them in the comments section of YouTube, and we'll be happy to answer them in a couple of minutes. Uh, ben, do you have any final uh, comments before we go into the question and answer period? Uh, no, I just do want to say that uh, 2023 was a year of a lot of proposed appliance standards. So this year will be a year of a lot of final standards. And I certainly hope that we take a 
tough look at these standards and look at any ways that we can to uh, to, to reverse them. This is an important issue, and you have to remain constantly uh, vigilant on the on these things. Uh, so much is going on, but it's it's important to uh, to look at these appliance regulations and to try to push back where we can. All righty. So. Thanks for being with us and talking about appliances. I'm sure we've got some questions from some of our viewers about, you know, regulatory factors, energy, and so forth and so on. So here's the first question from Albert Van Lingen. How do companies react to these new regulations like Samsung, LG, or Korea itself? I assume he's talking more specifically about overseas manufacturers than domestic manufacturers. Um. They uh, they have to comply as well. So uh, they they essentially they 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 accept the, uh, the 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 standards. Some some of them weigh in uh, in the comment periods, but uh, they 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 have to comply with the same standards. Sometimes they advantage uh, forward m manufacturers because so many of the the American facilities or older facilities that uh, may have a tougher time adapting. To, uh, to, to these standards. So in some cases, uh, uh, the forward makers actually have an advantage from these aggressive standards. Well, and I, I would argue, well, I would not argue, but I would say that it's almost certainly true that uh, the appliances issue is pretty much the same as the car issue is. I mean, if you want to bring a vehicle over that's a European model of, you know, a Mercedes or something, you have to get like every single light bulb changed. <laughs> in it because the European light bulbs don't follow the same energy efficiency standards or whatever as United States ones. Uh, there are models of Toyota that aren't offered in the United States. There are models of Volkswagen that aren't offered in the United States. What happens is they comply with the equipment that they send here, but they do not comply, obviously, with um, stuff that they have abroad. Well, in particular with the uh the dishwasher and short cycle appliance uh, washing machine standards. I know that um, because the rules had just been agreed to under Trump and proposed that Biden rescinded when the new rules started were proposed, um, you know, manufacturers had worked with them on that. They actually came out and said, hold it. This is going too fast. You're, you're changing the, the game here. We, we make plans and, you're changing the game and this we can't we don't think we can comply with these standards. I mean, so the manufacturers, at least in this instance, weren't trying to gin up business. They were saying, we think this is going to be bad for the consumer and us. Mm. You know, I have an idea. There's a in the in the technological industry, there is open source architecture. You know, you can get an open source piece of software. You can get an open source, um, like an alarm system, you know, where you put different modules together from different manufacturers to make things. Uh, we've even seen open source in the manufacture of guns using 3D printers. And I wonder if there is a future ahead of us where we might see open source dishwashers and washing machines and so forth and so on, where you can essentially build your own and not have to deal with all this regulatory nonsense. Ben, what do you think? Um, I really haven't given that much thought. One, one, one question is whether the regulations would apply, not that, not that people would be, uh, would, would be subject to enforcement actions, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if, whether you can make a cost-effective uh, appliance that way. Maybe we're getting to that point, but maybe we're not there just yet. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the black market for lawnmowers in California, by the way. <laughs> it's going to happen. Alex Pope asks, I would guess that hackers could turn your appliances off as well. Yeah, and that's why you may not want to connect your appliances to the Internet. May not connect them, you may not want to connect them to Wi-Fi um, because that is coming. The, the, the climate change killjoys will shut down your refrigerator or your washer or your heater or your, your hot water or whatever if they see an energy crisis coming up and wind and solar isn't filling the bill like it normally does in California during the summer where it just can't produce enough electricity to make the grid stable. Well, it doesn't even have to be an energy crisis. I suspect that if the climate killjoys get a hold of it, it'll be if you decide not to keep your thermostat down at at 67 or 68 during the winter, or, you know, if you turn it down to, uh, to below 75 in the summer, uh, the climate killjoy hackers would get in there and say, no, 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 that's not right. You've got to live with a little discomfort because we've got to save the planet. That's what, 
what I yes. think scares. Yes, discomfort to save the planet. That's the new thing. <laughs> Supernova Maga Taxi Crab. <laughs> what a name. I would wonder if home insurance would deny claims if you built your own appliances that did not have certification from standard agencies like Underwriters Laboratories. Well, yeah, I suppose that's a possibility. You know, uh, on the other hand, they won't not insure your home if you build, you know, something in your home like a, I don't know, model train set, for example, or I, I don't know what it might be. But, you know, the, the the whole regulatory thing is they can't they can't enforce what they don't know about. And that's the key to this, right? Right. I also want to uh, thank Peter Williams for his super chat that he sent to us. Thank you so much. Just like the others, um, we really appreciate it. And it helps us out a lot. Yeah, that almost two pounds of money is really going to make a big difference because we're not getting any money from big oil. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Just the same. So uh, <laughs> apropos of your statement. Anthony, my grandfather used to tell me when he'd do something, I say, granddad, that's against the law. That's wrong. He said, son, there's nothing against the law if you don't get caught. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to that point, I would say, you know, they're, I don't know if the, uh, the regulators are going to raid like your home if you don't have appliances that meet the standards or if you take the uh, water limiter off of your uh, shower head or something, but they, they do raid, for instance, um, you know, car modification places that will take, that'll do like exhaust work for you and stuff. They will raid those places. So I would imagine that if there was a company that was building, um, kind of pick a pack, uh, appliances, then they would probably get a knock at the door every once in a while, at least. Yeah, well, we used to have the Maytag repairmen. Now we're going to have the Maytag police. Well, when we have the Inflation Reduction Act Part 2, that's when the funding will for this will come, just like it did for the IRS, right? Well, we'll right. have to fund more enforcement, armed armed regulatory enforcers to go into people's homes to find out if they're using the wrong kind of washing machine or dishwasher. Yeah. All right, so we've had a fantastic discussion about appliances and efficiency standards and all that good stuff. We thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ben, for joining us here as a special guest. And thank you, Sterling and Linnea, also for joining us here, as you regularly do on Climate Change Roundtable. I want to remind everyone to visit our websites, climaterealism.com. Uh, climate at a glance.com, energy at a glance.com, and of course, what's up with that? And of course, if you want to learn more about regulatory information, visit the Competitive Enterprise Institute at CEI.org, and they've got all kinds of interesting things there. All right, so that's it for today. I'm Anthony Watt, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate for the Heartland Institute, wishing you all a wonderful Friday and a fantastic weekend. Bye bye. He's a lion, dog-faced pony soldier.